do something a little unusual. I'm going to read from one scripture and then not even really preach it, but move to another. Uh, we have uh, we probably have more in front of us today in this sermon than what I can get out. And so if I tell you something and it seems like I left off, just hang tight, I'll be back with you after I graduate and we'll pick that up, okay? Lord willing. Um, <laughs> so uh, I was writing a sermon. The Lord works through us in different ways. You know, you, you may come, come to things, you know, in your service to Him as you work with your hands, as you work with your mind. It's, you know, each of us have our strengths and our weaknesses, I suppose, and some of that factors into spiritual gifts. But the Lord, if I sit down and just start to write away, you know, God will, will uh, carry me on through Scripture as I study it. And so I wrote half a sermon and then had to set it aside for later and came to this one, and then this one became a sermon and a half. But I was drawn to Colossians 1 before we go to Hebrews. Colossians is not far from Hebrews in your Bible. And I will preach mainly from Hebrews 1. But I want you to hear just if you don't, if you don't have Scripture open to Colossians 1, beginning in verse 15, that's okay. I'll, I'll take you slowly through this. Sometimes it's just good enough to read it with minimal comment, right? This is speaking of Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. For by Him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers, or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He's, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. Alright, how do you think of Jesus when you think of Jesus? Just be honest with yourself. You can drive around town and we see that Christmas time is upon us and you've got the lights here and you've got the wreaths there. and you have the, they, they updated the snowflakes I noticed up and down Memorial Parkway. I was real proud of that. Nothing was wrong with the other ones, but hey, it was something new. You see, you see the, the Grinch, the Santa, the snowman, the reindeer, all of the cultural Christmas lore is out there and kids are delighted. And I'll be honest with you, I feel like a kid every time this you know, December comes upon us. I mean, we are a little bit wild with it. We usually get the tree up three or four weeks before you would consider it appropriate. And yet... Somewhere in the mix of that comes a nativity scene, doesn't it? And so you have the Magi, and there are always only ever three, although in reality there could have been as many as 100 or 200 or more. The Bible doesn't say. It mentions three gifts. That's why you always see three, three wise men. And then it has the shepherds there, and then you have uh, maybe uh, several well-behaved livestock. You have the sheep and the cattle. And they're in no sort of conflict. And the camel on which the Magi traveled, is, if he's featured in it, he's plopped down real nice and good. I don't know what camel behavior is to be expected, but that camel uh, is the sort that I guess I'd want to ride in on if I'm riding a camel. And then you get the, the star sometimes above the manger and uh, rather the, the stable. You get the little manger, the little trough. And then there's Jesus. And he is a, he's probably, if he's not the size of a three-year-old in the display, He's, his eyes are fully open and he's really alert. And, you know, that's just, uh, we can obscure the reality of that hard, cold night in a forgotten town into which the one of whom all that stuff was said entered. He's before all things and in him all things hold together. He's created all things and he comes down to this, to this feeding trough. And so can he not relate to anyone? If you've known being in the cold and being in the dark in your life, can you not relate to Jesus from the beginning of His earthly life? Because He's right there, wrapped in the swaddling cloth. The angels sang His praises up in the sky. 
the shepherds were revealed to hear that song. We don't, we don't have a record that that song was revealed all over the world. It could have been. God was willing to show it to the shepherds and call them to travel into town and see the little boy. The star was bright enough and unique enough to catch the attention of these, what we would say were probably astrologers, stargazers over in the Far East, and they made their journey. And realistically, the shepherds would have been long gone by the time the Magi made it, many months, perhaps years later. But we, don't, we, we prefer seeing them all together all at once. And yet the star didn't capture the attention of the rest of the world. And so if you feel like you've done a great thing and few people have noticed, can you relate to Jesus? I think you can. And this sermon title is called The Supreme Gift, Jesus. And so I have just, you know, I, I was just led of the Lord. I was praying about where to, where to do some preaching this, this Christmas season because you always think go to Luke or go to Matthew and do the early stuff or maybe go to Isaiah. And I, wanted, and I was just uh, remembering what I've heard from my Bible, from the Word of God. And I came to Hebrews 1. And I think we are going to get a lot out of this. And so when you think of Jesus, who are you thinking of? Are you thinking of someone who matters to you today, right now? And then maybe at about 11.30 or 12 o'clock, He's going to come back around next Sunday. I hope not. Or maybe He comes back Wednesday night and then He matters then. I, I, hope, I, hope, he, I hope that He doesn't leave your focus. I hope, that he doesn't, I hope that He doesn't become less to you when you walk out this door. Or is He someone that you call upon when you sense that there's trouble? That's good to do. But if it's only ever that, and you don't call upon Him much when there's praise to be given or when there's just ordinary life going about, then who is He really to you? How much do you think He cares about your sins and your forgiveness? Enough to bleed over it. Not to give His life over it. Revelation 13, 8 tells us that He was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So it's not as though God looked down at the world and said, look at what all has gone on down there. These people. I send, I send them prophets. I send them my spokesmen. They do signs. They do the wonders. They are unlike anybody else in society proclaiming, thus saith the Lord, and these people don't listen. They don't hear. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Oh, fortunately, I happen to have a, an only begotten son. I'll try him. No, it wasn't like that. It's not how God thought it through. Before human beings were made, it says, from the foundation of the world. God knows all of time and all that will happen. Everything is going to is set there before Him. He sees it all and He's... The Father and the Son agree that there will come a time when, he will, when the Son will come as a lamb to be slain. So Christmas is a long time uh, in the past planned for. As a matter of fact, planned, I would say, before even time began. And so we get to that Bethlehem cradle and we encounter a little boy. We can say this kind of thing about You read in Hebrews 1 with me. Hebrews 1 picking up in verse 1. This is going to be really some top shelf stuff. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir, the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Friends, think of verse 4 real quickly because we're going to read on ahead. Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited, uh, Savior, Messiah, Christ, is more excellent than theirs. I, you may not have a preoccupation with getting Jesus confused with an angel, okay? You may not be saying, you know, I'm just not sure where Jesus ranks in relationship to this angel or that angel or that angel or whatever. But evidently, when, when the Lord inspired these words uh, to the first readers, they had trouble with that thought. They were preoccupied with the elevation and veneration of angels. And so, 
Then verse 5 picks up and read that. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. Of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. In verse 12, like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? From the first paragraph, the writer goes out and, and draws out all these distinctions between Jesus and angels, doesn't he? And you and I aren't really probably preoccupied too badly with, with uh, which angel is up to this or that, maybe. Um, we don't have an angel atop that tree but if we were, it would likely be a glowing, blonde-haired, nice, very bright, uh, probably a lady, uh, which the Bible doesn't mention any uh, lady angels. Um, does, it only names two, Michael and Gabriel. I would say that angels are probably not quite as, uh, as, uh, as concerned with their names being known. But we go back to Jesus who is superior to these, to these heavenly beings. And angels are quite a powerful force. They can blind you in Sodom and Gomorrah if you're disobedient. They, they can uh, hold a flaming sword at the gate of Garden of Eden. That was the first appearance of an angel in the Bible. But Jesus is much more than all of this. All right, I got six things for you. Like I said, I probably won't get it all done, but here's what I want to do for you today. I want to lay it out kind of in plain speech, okay? It's Christmas time. You are thinking probably more than you usually do about the manger and the baby and all the scenery and all that matters there. And, and, and uh, I, I appreciate that. I am pleased to share with my culture uh, the sense that a special baby came into the world and we ought to take notice. But I don't want to leave it right there. I want you to understand what was going on as much as we can within about a half hour span of time with that little boy in that place, there and beyond, down to today and on forever, okay? And so we're focusing mainly on verses 2, 3, I believe. There's a lot in there. There are six dividing lines that I found that I'm going to emphasize for you, all right? And so when you consider Jesus this Christmas season, I want you to consider Him the, the supreme gift of all gifts. Jesus, as we see in the Scripture, I'm going to give you the six things right off. I don't expect you to write them down, but you need to hear them. Jesus, as He is, talking about everything that has been made, is going to receive it all. So He's going to receive it all. Because He created it all. And as we, as we can understand Him, He represents God's glory to all. Back to creation, He sustains it all. Then we shift from this creation and glory to priesthood of Jesus. Jesus paid it all. And then Jesus rules over all. The six things we're going to get into. How about that? The little baby in the manger scene will start with, He will receive it all. Go back to Hebrews 1 and just, or, and just look in verse 2. It's a, it's a fantastic statement. It echoes Colossians 1. So you know that this was on the mind of many... Uh, a thinker back in the early church. In Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verse 2, in about, in about halfway through verse 2, it says, God, it says, God has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things. Let's talk about that for a minute. I want to get you involved with this. Jesus is going to be what we call the inheritor of every single thing that there is worthy to inherit. Okay? Everything. Now, some of you may have inherited something from the passing of one or both of your parents. Some of you may have not. I hope I'm not touching a pain point, but it's typical 
in our society, sometimes the firstborn may get a different piece. That was in the biblical times. The firstborn got the cream, they got the cream off the top and on about half of the dish, no matter how many other kids there were. But in our society, parents may want to more evenly distribute an inheritance among the children. Now, some of you may not have inherited anything to this point. Your parents are still alive. Wonderful. Enjoy them while you, while you have them. Some of you may not expect to inherit very much. Some of you might not have even thought about this. I'll be honest with you. It's not a thought on my mind. But for Jesus, He, he does not have to have anyone die for Him to inherit anything, not even Himself. Because he has, he has been the one who owns and can claim all that there is since time began. Now, let's consider that. Jesus owns and claims every square inch of every space and every place. Every time. How do I say that? Because when it says, following this, through whom He also created the world, I don't want to bore you with the Greek. But let me help you with it. Where is the word world used in, the, in a famous place in the Bible? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. There, you Greek readers, if I ever get the chance to teach you all biblical Greek, it's a dream of mine one day. I'm going to put all you country people through it. Cosmos. Go ahead and note it. Cos, cosmic. You use the word cosmic cosmological, cosmos was speaking of the whole world of humanity in that context. That's not the word in Hebrews 1. It's eon. The age, the period in which something was going on in the world. Jesus is claiming everything that is worthy to claim that is going to be passed on into the new heaven and the new earth. From every age, every world. It says the kings of the earth will bring their treasures into the new Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. It says that the nations are going to be represented. Every people will be in this innumerable number of those who are praising Him and He is going to get the glory. Why? How in the world can one man have all that? Well, when you happen to have made everything, it can all come back to you. Especially if you're pretty good at taking care of it along the way. And if you're a very gracious caretaker like Christ. We should have no trouble with this concept. Jesus is going to claim you. He's going to claim me one way or the other. And in His claiming, He is going to do the right thing with our testimony. He is the just judge of the living and the dead. And I'd like for you to be on the inside track of being claimed by Him and going to heaven and enjoying Him forever. I'd like for you to have that. And now, what, what He will... What he even goes on to have a, the Apostle Paul write in Ephesians chapter 1, we are referred to, if, we're, if you're a believer in Jesus, you are referred to as Christ's glorious inheritance, meaning that of all the things he is inheriting, he's going to have, he's not as concerned with the fact that you're amazed at the mountain range or the coastline or, or some natural feature or some incredible principle of reality that he's going to have. He, he is treasuring your soul. He treasures your soul more than he treasures the stuff of earth. We ought to be the same way. We ought to be treasuring the souls of men more than the stuff of earth. As Christ does that. Not only that, He's going to share with you all the good things that He has for Himself. In 1 Corinthians 3, 21-23, Paul has been dealing with this argument between I prefer the teaching of Paul or I prefer the teaching of Apollos or I'm in the tribe of Peter or I'm in the tribe of this or that. And then he goes on to say, let no one boast in men. All things are yours whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. You are Christ's. Christ is God's. You ever felt like you could have just used a little bit more? Money, food, company, time. I feel like I could use a little bit more time all the time. If there's anything that scuttles right away out of your hands in life, it's time. You turn around and the kids are talking and then they're, they're doing something else you didn't expect and weren't prepared for. And you got to make adjustments and then you turn around again and they're graduating from something. They're getting into some new kind of trouble that you got to help them with. And if you don't have children, you turn around and you got a few less hairs here, there, or yonder. Or if your kids are moved out, then other things change. 
The president got in that you didn't want, but before you know it, it's time to vote again. Time passes by. You will inherit eternal time. That's even hard to imagine. It doesn't even work. You will inherit timelessness to go on and do as you were made to do and redeemed to do forever and ever. I think we'll have jobs in heaven, tasks, assignments that are going to be perfect for us. I really do. I think we will, I think we will feast. We will celebrate. It's not all harps and clouds. The harp is really a picture of uh, beauty and joy and, and a joyful noise. Some of y'all don't. Some of y'all need to grab a lesson from Brother Pat on the three-string cigar box guitar, maybe before you step in there. I don't know, but we will get up to heaven and we will be making a joyful noise through all that we do. And Jesus is sharing everything with us when we are there. Jesus made it all. He made it all. I was fascinated in this study. Um, I, I thought about, you know, this counts for the speck of dust that you wipe off your, de off your desktop or, your, or the dashboard. This counts for the stars and the planets. He made it all. That's really amazing, isn't it? You were cheering for a football team last night, perhaps. If there are any Georgia fans here, we might need to open a grief counseling clinic later. But you were, you were cheering, some of you, See, I have this whole thing where my, I got some family that went off to Auburn and I kind of like have this semi like, what do, I, what do I do when they're doing? But then I just usually cheer for Alabama. I just always cheered for Alabama. My brother's down at Auburn, so he's kind of, you know, married to, anyway. I uh, have to say God made every football player and he is the one behind every ability that they displayed on that field. And that's just, that's just a small human effort. There is no rocket on 565 if God did not give us the stuff of earth and the wits of our minds to construct such technology. Okay? The galaxies in our universe are so many light years apart that I ran the equation of how long it would take to get from where we are to the most distant one, and the answer had a letter in it. 2.976e plus 14 is the concluded answer of how long it would take in light years to get to the furthest galaxy. Someone in here knows what that means and can help you, but all I know is you won't get there. But Jesus can walk from one to the other. Holds it all in His hands. You're saying He's got the whole world in His hands. He's got 2.976e plus 14 distance in His hands. He made it all. Hebrews tells us, through whom He also created the world. Oh, this is just quite a bit. This is the baby that was born in Bethlehem. He made the manger. He made Mary. You know, Millie will never be able to say, I made you. No, you didn't, doll. I'm going to tell you what. Jesus can say to Mary, I did make you. And numbered the hairs on your head. He was born through the virgin into a world that failed to recognize what was happening except for a few. Mm. He made all those disciples. He made all that were around Him at the cross. He made the wood that fashioned the cross. He made the ore and the steel that formed the nails. When He told Adam in Genesis chapter 3 of the curse, He said, thorns and thistles you will have on the earth. He knew in saying that one day He would have a crown of thorns that He made. And this is Him we come and worship. So there's literally not a square inch you're looking at that He's not involved with. He's created it. He claims it. And He sustains it. Get into this with me. He sustains all things. In the book of Hebrews, the writer goes on, he says, He appointed heir of all things through whom He also created the world. Verse 3, He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of His nature. He upholds the universe by the word of His power. We're jumping ahead to He upholds the universe by the word of His power. The word of God is living and active. Hebrews is where we read that. Sharper than a two-edged sword. Living, it gives life. Active, activity carries on because Jesus says it should. So when you look at the universe that, that He has made, you look at the world, you look at our little piece of it, you might conclude that God is a, great, is a great designer. God is like a great watchmaker, some have said. And when you open the face of a watch and you see all that causes it to keep time, and then you go, wow, somebody made that. And you know what? You didn't have to keep the watchmaker with you to keep the watch running. 
And so it's a bit of a weak analogy. Some have used that to say that God has made the universe like a watchmaker makes a watch and then just puts it there and walks off. That's not what the Bible teaches us. That's not what reality is. Reality is that Jesus is actively sustaining things. I can put food in front of our little Millie Lou and she can be a good girl or she can be her, herself and be picky and choose only like four things and we love her. She can eat it, but I can't make her heart beat. I can't make her lungs draw breath. My contribution to her living matters and yet God's contribution to all of our living is, the one, is what we truly need and what we pray for. And so in the day that He is appointed for you to leave this earth and go to glory, guess what He will do? His Word will say, from there to here. And you'll be there if you're in Christ. So He sustains all things. Paul says in Acts 17.25 that God doesn't need us to serve Him the way that uh, idol worshipers were serving their gods then with food offerings and things of that nature, thinking that the gods were getting literally hungry because He gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Life and breath and everything. What sustains a church? Why is there a church in Afghanistan? Why is there a church in China? We mentioned them earlier. Why is there a church in southern Madison County? There will be a church where Jesus will sustain a church. Yet it falls on to us as His church to make sure that His Word and His person are centered in all that we are and all that we're about. That's firmly, I'm, I'm going to take an aside. I didn't write this down in my, in my prayer or in anything like that. I'm going to take an aside for a second. I'm going to tell you, you know why churches that deny the truth of the Bible and the, the divine nature of Jesus start to thin out? Why people will often just go elsewhere and quit altogether? There's no power in that anymore. The Word which has been spoken and given by the Holy Spirit tells us what is true. And if we disbelieve that, then we cut ourselves off from the power source that sustains anything we're about. And so you can go, and, and, and I, like we mentioned Europe, go to beautiful cathedrals. They were once crowded. Whether Catholic or whether Protestant after all the Protestantism took off, they were crowded with worshipers. And then, why is it that a congregation will be joyful in the Holy Spirit and, and they're struggling to have seating in a building and yet it's not as beautiful as the cathedral? You know, I love good architecture as much as I can, but the Word is where the power is. It doesn't matter what you, what you decorate it all with. If you don't preach the Word as the Word is written, then you're just going to have folks come in. This is the tradition. This is what Paul Paul did. That's what, you know, that's what they were raised to do, but then they go home and they don't really believe much of it. And so then that's why they'll vote for, for somebody who will come in and bring in all kinds of unbiblical policies to the country. That's why they'll go and they'll do things that are just unheard of for a Christian to even think or do. And so when you, when you have a church where the Word is given to you and you can believe it and hear it and act on it, Jesus can sustain what's going on there. And the right response to people who don't understand that is not to deride them and malign them and it's a, honestly pray and live Christian life around them anyway. Now, Christmas is an interruption to your pride and my pride. <laughs> A little boy steps out of eternity into time. He cries out in a manger. And we have to understand, that's not the first time the night had heard his cry. That's not the first time the sky had heard his voice. When he said, let there be light. And he said, let there be the sun and the moon. They were hearing the voice of God then. And I'm sure that creation recognized that voice right there. Though it be a newborn is where I got started not confused about who owns it. Jesus represents God's glory to all. Oh man, we're going to have to hurry or break it up. Jesus represents the radiance of the glory of God. We read again back in verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. Now, this, this word, you would have gotten a coin for pay in this culture, and the coin would have had on it the imprint of the leader of, of whoever was Caesar in Rome, or perhaps the wife of the Caesar if she was favored enough to make it on a coin. And that would be the only imprint that you would see that would help you know who is your nation's leader. They did not have 
Fox. They did not have the other news channels. They did not have all that where they could constantly profile the foibles and the, the gains and the losses of whoever was in charge. And so when you, use, when you found a coin that was really a clear picture of who was in charge, you said the exact imprint. That's the exact imprint. The word is character. We get the word character where you are not duplicitous. You're one person all the time. You have good character. That's the exact imprint of God, Jesus. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. That's describing Jesus. And the word was with God. And the word was God. They're distinct. They're unified. Now, when you think of this, God's glory, we've, we've sang songs about glory to God. Uh, you know, we talk about um, the doxology. That word comes from the word for glory. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Doxa means glory. Now, glory in the Scripture has to do with this unapproachable light, this, this sense that God is so great you just can't even really begin to last in His presence. I think about what happened to the Apostle Paul. He's going on the Damascus Road. He's there. He's going to go and take Christians out of their churches. He's going to arrest them. He's going to have them persecuted. And Jesus comes. And what is the manifestation of Jesus in that event in Acts 9? He's a baby at that first Christmas morn. He is a radiant bright light on the Damascus Road. And what happens to the Apostle Paul? Not, not yet the Apostle, but soon to be. What happens to him? He's blind. Three days. Because the glory he can't handle. It is so much that it overcomes him and overwhelms him. When Moses was on top of Sinai taking the law and writing it down, and he comes down and he speaks to the Israelites, what did they complain about to him? It's not Moses, you've been gone too long. It's not Moses, you need to take a shower. It's been 40 days up there. Your face is so radiant, we can't stand to look at it. The glory of God is rubbed off on Moses and he has to veil himself to go up there. Come down, speak. They can't handle looking at it. Some people have asked, if God is there, why doesn't He just show Himself like this? Why, why, wouldn't, why didn't Jesus come down and maybe stand on a grand building or the Statue of Liberty or something or just make the world say it's Him? You want everybody to go blind for a while? You want, you want to, you know... When, when He appears in, in the end of all things, there are going to be people who dread it so much they're going to pray that instead stones would fall upon them. His glory overwhelms people. Yet He still is right there with you, ever, ever present, nonetheless. And so, He represents God's glory to all. He represents God's glory toward people who are hurting. When He forgives them or heals them or... or defends them against false accusation. He represents God's glory toward people who know that they are a struggling guilty sinner because He will not cast out any who come to Him. He represents God's glory in, in miraculous ways. And when you read the Gospels and you see this, how does God feel about it when uh, crowds have come to hear the Word and they're hungry? Well, He would like for them to have their needs met and be fed. How does God feel about it when children interrupt uh, what we think is a holy time? Well, He says, let the little children come to Me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. How does God feel about it when taxpayers are complaining about their taxes? Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. How does God feel about it when the soldier is in the Roman army and wants to then become a Christian? Should I quit my government job, sir? No. Through John the Baptist, whom Jesus said is the greatest of those born among women. Keep on working and don't be duplicitous. Don't, do, don't rob people. So you can take what Jesus has said directly. You can take what God has revealed through others directly, which He stamps His approval as His Word. And then you can understand all this... Jesus is revealing to you the glory of God in the details. Now then, Jesus paid it all. Whew, man, I can't believe I made it to this point. I get to sing the last song and it makes sense. I thought I was going to have to leave point number five off. But you all held me accountable. Thank you. Your stairs said, come on, Pastor. So, Jesus paid it all. This brings us to the point of having to talk for a second about priests in the Old Covenant times, you would have men from the tribe of Levi called to serve as priests in the temple complex. 
And we understand, we see some of them in Scripture. Zechariah had his time to go in and offer the incense, and he was of the, uh, the priesthood group appointed by Lot. And then we know that the angel spoke to him in that service and said, you have a miracle son, name him John. By the way, believe an angel when an angel tells you to name your kid this or that because he didn't get to talk for nine months because he said, what? We believe the angel. All right. He was a priest. Caiaphas was the high priest at the time when Jesus was tried and falsely convicted and crucified yet for our sins. And so priests are this, this representative of one who is the go-between between the ordinary worshiper and God. The priest is, is this human mediator who takes upon himself this from God's call, this role of doing these special sacrificial rites. People would bring the sacrificial animal to the altar and the priest would go through the process of slaughtering the animal and it would be a bloody business. But he was to know the law code and know what that animal meant and what sin or what, what sort of offering that animal represented. And he was to carry out his function. And in the book of Hebrews, it says something really fascinating that informs us better than you just having to hear me. And that's in chapter 10. Chapter 10. It says this, it says, Since the law, verse 1, you can go there, it's in your pew Bible or your Bible. Chapter 10, verse 1, Since the law was but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are offered continually every year make perfect those who draw near. Verse 2, Otherwise they would not have ceased to be offered. or Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would have no, I misread that. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins, meaning that if you could put a bull on an altar and it got you straight with God for eternity and you never had guilt over your sin again, would you go take another bull? Exactly, Millie. She says, no. But they continue to offer sacrifices. In these, there is a reminder of sins every year. The point of the sacrifices of old was to really say, it is a life-for-life life thing when one transgresses a holy God. And it is a business of, of having to, to even see the very lifeblood shed because God takes sin so seriously. Verse 4, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. They're, they're not as valuable as human beings. Now we get to verse 5. When Christ, consequently, when Christ came into the world, He said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you've taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. He's quoting there from Psalm 40, by the way. Now, if I skip down to verse 11, it says, Every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifice. Take note of that. Every priest stands. Priests don't sit. They must stand. Sitting indicates it is finished. Only Jesus has ever uttered those words with authority. It is finished. That's why it says, when verse 12, when Christ had offered... For all time, a single sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus has paid in His substitutionary death for you and me for everything that would have separated us from God's presence, love, grace, power, fatherhood. And so He has once and for all fulfilled what the sacrifices were meant to indicate all along. When God saw the perfect blood of His one and only Son on the altar that we all could admit, say, I, I should have been there. In my place condemned He stood. He paid it all. He paid it all. So when, when He cries out on the cross to tell us that it is finished, no priest has ever been able to walk away from the altar and say that. No priest. Oh, and there were thousands of them throughout the centuries. So Jesus paid it all. 
And then Jesus rules over it all. So he is seated. The baby at Christmas time would complete his mission to save fallen humanity. All who would believe, all who repent and believe in the gospel would be saved. He said it is finished. And then he rose from the grave. And then he, he stays on earth for 40 days and he ministers and he gets to know, you know, he, he, goes, he goes and reveals himself to more and more of these people who had hoped that he would be the Messiah. And it says that it was even, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 500 brothers at one time saw him. So it began with smaller groups and spread from there. And so Jesus would selectively and carefully let people know, I am risen, you now carry the message forward. You now go, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. He rules over all. He is seated at the right hand of God. It says back in chapter 1 of Hebrews, where we've been primarily focusing, it says that after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Us voting people don't like to think of an authoritarian, singular individual who can call all the shots, do we? We want accountability and democratic processes and being able to hold our elected leaders' uh, feet to the fire when they go astray and say, hold up now. Better watch what you're doing. We didn't vote for that. Nobody voted for Jesus. Oh, but you would if you knew him. But it wouldn't matter. He is already reigning on high. He is already ruling from heaven with a perfect rule that none can thwart, none can come against, none can outvote, none can outdo. And so in Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord says to my Lord, David, King David's writing this, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. One day everyone who opposed him, whether invisible or visible opposition, will answer. And he will have justice. But this is where I want to end, guys. I, I want to draw you into this. Jesus is up there at the right hand of the Father in heaven in majesty. And what is He doing for you? He's praying for you. Romans 8.34 says that He intercedes for us. Jesus prays for you. He, he can walk across the stars he, he claims everything is His own. He paid it all and then he's, he's, he, he prays for you. You don't even know everything you should be praying for. I don't know everything I should be praying for. I, we don't have the time to pray in a 24-hour day where we need to sleep at least some of it to pray for everything that we need to be praying for. You could devote your whole life to the prayers, prayers for other people, prayers for yourself, and you'll run out. But Jesus has eternal opportunity to say in the presence of His Father, Father, why don't you take care? Why don't you take care of this one? Why don't you take care of Jesse, Jessica, Rana, Ed, Donald, Gail, all of you. He's praying for you. And He knows what you need more than, more than you and I know what we need. And So when you come to Him with something and you know you need Him to act, if it's in keeping with His will, He's already been there asking for it. So you ask. And then you wait. And then you see. God's ways are not always our ways. But you ask in faith. And so, do you have somebody who you wish knew what Christmas really was for? Jesus knows that's on your heart. And He prays for you for that person as well. Since that person is on your heart. You think He wouldn't like to see that person saved more than you would? Absolutely He would. And so, when you go past those manger scenes as you're driving out, and I hope you drive out and look at Christmas lights, fill your thermos up with whatever you need. Uh, we, we go with uh, spice cider. Get you a sugar cookie Keep both hands on the wheel as much as you can, but take a sip every now and then and look at Christmas lights. And when you see a manger scene, remember that the one laying in the manger claims everything else that you see and everything you don't see. That He made it all. That 
it goes on because He wants it to go on that He is more glorious than you'll ever know and that He has paid for your sins and He rules over the whole world and will one day make a new one out of it. How about that for a little Christmas time thought? Jesus is unspeakably glorious and able to save to the uttermost all who call on Him. Um, at 19 years of age, as I reckon it, I had spiritual experiences leading up to that point, I, I'll guarantee, and I believe God will, will you know, oftentimes, He's calling out to people and wanting, you know, drawing them close. They'll have a spiritual experience along the way. I believe at 19, the lights came on, and I was able to really surrender and do what, you know, in, in the way that I knew how, and by His grace and His help, He says, repent and believe in the good news. And so, I hope you've done that because I can tell you this. When I started hearing Hark the Herald Angels Sing, O Holy Night, then I started to say, wait, we've been singing this all along? And they sing this on the radio and not on the Christmas channel or the Christian channels? You go into a restaurant and they're singing, mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die? That's truth. Word of the Father now in flesh appearing. What deeper thought can you have than that? <laughs> Don't miss Christmas. The only way to do that is to miss Christ. So, I'll just pray for you. Heavenly Father, look at each and every heart and soul today at Hobbs Island Church. Lord, would you uh, speak to these individuals now. They've heard, your, they've heard your written word of Hebrews chapter 1, just a little bit of it. Would you let that resonate? I'm not capable of speaking to every heart as, as needs to be, so would you do that? And if there's something, a step of obedience, something uh, difficult that they know they've been uh, putting off, that would be very glorifying to you if they did it. Maybe it's contacting somebody this Christmas time. Maybe it's not even a long conversation, but a simple offer of prayer. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's going to uh, someone who, where the relationship is strained and hard and just pouring out grace, patience, and love because we've known that. Or maybe it's someone who is a little bit rattled about their spiritual condition and that could be a good thing because I don't intend for the sheep to not feel like they're sheep, but Lord, if, if there are those who need to uh, truly believe in Jesus, then we don't want another day to go by. If they would say, I'm not the way, He is the way. I'm not the Savior, He is the Savior. I don't have the merits, but He'll give me all the merits because He has all the merits that the Father would require. This is a free gift. This is a supreme gift. Would you just give this gift, Lord, to those who would ask for it? And why would they not? Friends, I would like you to know that as, as we close, keep your eye, head bowed, eyes closed, as we do this, as we uh, wrap up our time, um, we, we have leaders and you have friends here who'd love to hear, hear what God is doing in your life or how you might need help or anything, any matter of prayer, any matter of spiritual needs you have, that includes salvation. That includes perhaps a restoration of fellowship with God that, that you might need to pursue. And that may include a, a deeper sense of dedication to Him. Let us pray with you before you leave, please. Otherwise, I hope you walk with Him by faith every step of the way the rest of this week. We're going to sing one song in closing. Song goes, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. You know, I have a guitar behind me, but Billy Dunlap next week wants y'all to sing some a cappella. Y'all know that? So when y'all come in next week, I need y'all to be good and ready to hit that register just, just on point. Why don't we sing this one, if we can, a cappella. Let's all stand and do that. That's going to challenge some of us. Now, I've attended many a Church of Christ service where they do this. But I do not know what all you're supposed to do with your hand. 
So if I'm doing something with my hand, that is instinctive. Maybe it's a spiritual reflex or something. But you just follow with us in this song. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. He's going to be here with a couple of hymns next week while we're in New Orleans. I got to walk with a cap and gown. Uh, 